right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mary Beth Gassman. It's really a pleasure to be here with you today. I am a professor at Rutgers University, and I also have the honor of being the executive director of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Institute for Leadership, Equity, and Justice, as well as the Rutgers Center for Minority Serving Institutions. And we are the sponsor of today's event. We are so lucky this year to have Walter Kimbrough as our president in residence. He's been doing all kinds of wonderful things with us. And today he is here uh, going to give a talk called Things Fall Apart, Solving the HBCU Leadership Volatility Crisis. Couldn't be a more timely topic. For those of you who are new to Walter, he has served as the president of both Dillard University and Philander Smith College and in a variety of other issues or institutions, sorry, uh, in a variety of other institutions, just a, a wealth of information and knowledge, especially when it comes to historically black colleges and universities. So welcome, Walter. It is really, really wonderful to have you with us. Uh, we will, um, he's going to give a talk and then we will have plenty of time for uh, questions. So please put your questions in the Q&A and we will try to get to as many as we possibly can. Uh, uh, welcome, Walter. All right. So uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I want to thank Mary Beth and the Center for um, having me this semester to uh, participate as the president in residence. And as a part of the conversation, she was like, you could do some webinars. I did one a couple of months ago, and I looked at um, hazing, which is my expert, uh, one of my expert areas. Uh, actually, just recently got asked to do a couple of expert witness cases. So um, that this is something that I, I still enjoy doing. It's really tough work when you think about some of those issues. But the other thing I've been looking at and I have tracked over my career is um, the changes in the HBCU presidency. I, I keep a running list and I can tell you every HBCU permanent presidential transition since about 1990. Uh, and so it's fascinating. And so then every now and then I try to go in and look at the data and see if there are different trends, who's being selected, who loses out or who's, you know, terminated or resigned, those kinds of things. And so I thought because there has been a lot in the news recently about just the volatility of the presidency that I would talk about it like this. Now, when I do talks, I like to have a creative title. And so this title, Things Fall Apart, I was actually thinking about the Roots album, Things Fall Apart, um, you know, with the Erica Badu song. That's a great album. And it's also a novel, which is where they got their title from. But it's sort of that's what's happening. It's like things are just falling apart in terms of leadership and governance for HBCUs. And, you know, maybe there are some ideas about how we get past that. So that's what I hope to do today. The, the other part, as Mary does say, I've had a chance to be president of two HBCUs and I've been fortunate and, and I feel really blessed to have worked with the boards that I have worked with. Um, Philander Smith was a tougher job initially. Um, with some of the challenges we faced there, but you when know, I got to a place like Dillard, the board chair at the time was very involved in AGB. One of the search committee members who became the board chair when I left is the attorney that led the Maryland $577 million lawsuit. So, of course, I've had good board leadership that really understands governance and HBCUs, and everybody does not have that. And when you don't have that, things do fall apart. So the governance piece is very important as well. So let's, let's dive into it a little bit. You've all seen the headlines. This has been a really interesting time and people are legitimately, they've asked it before, but they're asking it legitimately. Who wants to be a college president? Um, the resignations are not just an HBCU phenomenon. There are lots of things that are happening where you're seeing more and more people resign. This is at the beginning of the year. Um, David Gearhart, who I know who is at the University of Arkansas, just talks about it that, you know, all of these groups you're trying to appease. So how do you manage all those kinds of things um, with everybody? And so he says, which, and I think the former uh, president of the U UT system said the same thing, this might be the toughest job in America, particularly now in terms of some of the, the political scrutiny. Uh, it definitely makes a top five easily. I would say that. Um, Tom Chesney, who is president of an institution in Iowa, posted this on Twitter about a year ago. And I think it is very um, uh, thoughtful in terms of people resigning that he felt like people would choose other because the role has changed. I, I became a president in 2004 and the presidency 20 years later is fundamentally different. It's one of the things that you'll see in some of my comments. Part of the reason is that we've had to add in the social media, which is just throwing everything into a mix. Um, but he says, you know, to be a president now requires a mindset that people either don't possess or they can't adapt fast enough to survive. So it's not just 
I have the credentials to be a president, there is a mindset that you have to have to be in this sort of rough and tumble environment of the, the modern college presidency. So I think Tom is really on to something that people have to think about, not do I just want to do the job, do I have the ability, but do I have the mindset and even the grit, if you will, to be able to deal with this? Um, you know, we saw these hearings uh, and then a recent hearing with the president of Columbia. Um, you have people that are just lining up to come after college presidents. And it's almost like keeping a scorecard. Let's get how many can we get rid of? We got rid of two of the three. They probably still want the third. And then as we are doing this webinar now, um, Speaker of the House Mike Johnson from Louisiana, my state, is speaking at Columbia. And he's going to call for their president's resignation today. So I mean, we've just never seen anything like that where people are picking on college presidents at targets. And one of the things that I've argued is that if you listen to the hearing, I listened to the Columbia president hearing, you had people who obviously have no idea how a college campus works questioning her. So when you have one of the, the, the representatives saying, well, can't you just stop people from passing out flyers? It's like, I'm asking, do you know how large Columbia is? And what kind of workforce do you need to go across every student who is passing out a flyer? They might be passing out a flyer about a party, community service opportunity, an internship. So you want them to stop and cost everybody who's passing out flyers? It's just unrealistic expectations that are being placed on college presidents, which is making this a tough job. I think some of this is summed up in this great book that came out recently. Brian Rosenberg is one of my favorite um, higher ed presidents. He was, he's retired now from McAllister, but he's written a lot of great op-eds over the years. The book is an easy read, but it's really great. So I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, and he just sort of, you know, lays out some of the things in terms of the challenges um, is that we've got the challenges with the costs in terms of being all these things weigh on being a college president. Uh, if you don't have an enormous endowment, that's a challenge as a part of that. You have fewer people who are willing to pay for it. So basically, we don't have enough students to be able to deal with it. And so when we need to make changes, there are a lot of these, these ch challenges that he says are impediments that in terms of, you know, how do we deal with our reputation? People don't want to make changes if it impacts reputation. What kind of incentives do you have to provide? The disciplines, how do we get people to think out of those silos? Um, shared governance and tenure, some of those sacred cows that we'd have to do something different with that we're not willing to make those hard decisions. So like I said, all of these add to the challenges of being a president. And so now you have publications like the Wall Street Journal doing these big articles. This is a 2004 article, one at New College Presidents, Mission Impossible. Okay. So that sets the the, the, the stage for in that article, um, they talked about all the high profile institutions that are seeing the resignations. Um, and, you know, Bill Funk basically likened the position of being a professional fundraiser and a public relations executive combined with the mayor of a city. So once again, showing the complexity of these jobs. Uh, and then this, I think, is a great quote. He talked to a president that says there are 34 major groups and at any given time, 16 were unhappy. OK, so it's that's part of the challenge that we're dealing with. Um, the late Joseph Lowry, who co-founded the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, uh, actually was my pastor in Atlanta for a while. He would always say, when America has a cold, Black America has pneumonia. So if it's hard for all of higher education, what is it like for HBCUs? And we've seen our own set of challenges. So as of today, I don't think anything has been filled. There are currently 18 HBCU presidential vacancies. And I looked over the last few years, if you talk about 78 four-year HBCUs, at any given time, roughly a quarter of them are unfilled, either in a room, somebody just left, somebody about to come in. That's a high level of instability. If you're talking about a quarter of that sector, pretty much any given time you look, okay? So that's really high. So that's part of the challenge that we're dealing with. And as I indicated, there have been lots of articles. These are articles since last fall, just dealing with the issues facing the challenges with HBCUs in a number of publications. I want to share some of those thoughts and some of the colleagues that have commented, because I want you to hear some other voices as to why they think some of this is happening. Again, this is not new. We've written, we've seen articles written going back to 2000, you know, a decade ago saying there's a lot of turnover. You see, I'm, I'm pictured in one from the Chronicle 2012. They're talking about a lot of turnover. This is right before I went to Dillard. Um, so we've been talking about turnover for a while. So this is not a new problem. OK, it's not a new problem. But let's sort of just give you a, a landscape. These are just some public uh, documents that are out there now that's in the news right now. Arkansas Baptist, which is in Little Rock. You see, they've had 
the same interim three times in recent years. They've had that much turnover in recent years. The latest president was only there for a year. So a lot of turnover for that, that institution, really short periods of time. This is one that I'm surprised has sort of died down a little bit. And I don't know if you follow this a lot, but there have been challenges with the state legislature that they had this threat that they were just going to get rid of the entire board because they thought that the audits were bad. The board wasn't doing a good enough job. So um, the current president, Dr. Glover, announces last year she's going to retire 11 years. She's done a fantastic job with that institution, but there's still the politics of Tennessee and people are just needling. And particularly after she pushed and other people to say, hey, here's this report from the federal government. You guys owe us over a billion dollars. So it was almost like an invitation to say, oh, you're going to ask for this money. <laughs> We're going to come after you, which sort of seems that's exactly what happened. So they're starting the process, the search process. They're doing everything. While all this is going on, the state house is working to vacate their board. They want to get rid of everybody and have the governor bring in a completely new board. So all these things are happening at the same time. So you're trying to figure out what's going to happen. Uh, so they identify three finalists. They start their interviews the last week of March. They interview one. They interview the second. On the day they interview the second, the House and the Senate vote to vacate the entire board. The governor signs it. So while they're finishing up interviewing a candidate for president, the whole board is vacated. And they get word to the board to let them know, you all are all gone and your third candidate will not interview tomorrow. OK, I've never seen anything like that before. So they just hijacked it in the middle of the process. So they left everything hanging. OK, they said the, the governor came in. This is 529 p.m. They're finishing up that second interview that day. Governor's like whole new board. So everybody's out. OK, and so, so what do you do now? It's been a month. Tomorrow will make a month, four weeks. And there's been no conversation about what are you doing about this presidential search? You had these finalists. One is completely hanging because he didn't even get a chance to interview. No one said anything about it. So that creates a lot of instability, which some alums and students talked about. But that's a part of it. So now you see the governance instability that's driven wholly by politics. OK, it's just been crickets. And I'm just surprised there hasn't been more pushback. Um, from a lot of people there to say, we've got to do something about this. I guess they'll have to do an interim president now um, because they didn't see like there's any movement. Um, but that's that becomes a challenge. And then this is something that happened within the last month. It just shows you sometimes there are challenges even on the campus is that this makes the news because there is a press release that goes out saying we've named our next president. OK, and that this president candidate will be on campus to meet with me on people. Later that day, the board sends out a communication saying, no, the president that we have is still the president. We're still going through the process. And the, the announcement that was sent out was not a scheduled or authorized by the Board of Trustees. That's it's simply crazy. You have an announcement that's sent all out saying we have a new president. That person is on campus for a meet and greet. And then the board sends out another correspondent saying, no, we haven't done. We haven't made the final decision yet. And that announcement is not an official announcement. OK. This gives you an idea of just some of the instability that we see. This, these are things falling apart. These are three examples recently of things falling apart. And so these articles talk a lot about what's going on. And you can sort of, even starting with the Washington Post, is looking at some of those things, OK? Um, Terrell Strayhorn has written and talked about this with his HBCU Center at Virginia University, uh, Virginia Union University, um, just to talk about, you know, this is just part of a larger trend in higher education. Um, and then you can just see the, the, the latest ACE study came out 5.9 years. According to his analysis, the recently departed presidents, those short term people, they were only staying 2.1 years. OK, so that's, you know, half of a, a four year contract or not even a three year contract if they got a three year contract. Uh, as a part of that article, they interviewed uh, Dr. Pinkert, who retired recently from Wilberforce University. And I think he's very honest about this. And we actually had a conversation about it this summer, just talking about how hard the work is um, and how it attacks your health as a person. So you work really hard, but it, it, there is a drain on you. Uh, as Cornel West said once on the Tavis Smiley Forum, there is a cost that's a part of what happens to you when you do these kinds of jobs. And so um, that's a part of what he experienced at a school that has a lot of challenges you put in those years, but that sometimes limits the ability for you to stay because of the, the lift that's, that's part of it. 
Uh, Felicia Commodore, who is now at Illinois, I believe, I think that's right, um, talked about this as a part of this article. Um, and she just says the relationship with the board's faculty and students, that, that makes a difference. Um, the high number of turnover from women presidents is something uh, that's less, and you'll see more about that because I document that as well. And she leans into it a little bit more because HBCUs are doing a better job in selecting presidents with a greater diversity in terms of gender. But then if they get in there and they're unceremoniously ushered out with shorter tenures, that's not good either. OK, so she asked about that, which I think is something that we've got to continue to look at. OK. This article from last uh, summer. Once again, why is there the surge? Just Terrell again talking about this. And so he indicates just the job is hard. But once again, for HBCU presidents, now we're talking about, you know, the enrollment, you know, your deferred maintenance with your facilities, trying to recruit the right folks, uh, the fiscal issues. All of those things are challenges. OK, so that makes it harder. Then, of course, those of us who were presidents during the pandemic, you had this other thing that happened, and for a lot of institutions, it was an even heavier lift because they had no way to immediately go to any kind of remote educational delivery. I think I was fortunate, and I tell people this because we're in New Orleans, and with the threat of hurricanes and having to be displaced, we had a system that we could go to easily. So my lift wasn't as heavy as people who initially, when it happened, they were doing old school correspondence, email your professor your work, because they did not have a platform. OK, so for a lot of people, that took a lot out of them because you didn't have even a platform to be able to do that. So that's a challenge. Uh, so that's what he says. Then you're learning how to deal with crisis management, social media, growing revenue and then all the larger social movements, how they impact the campuses and the students and to be aware of those kinds of things as well. OK, uh, this one, HBCUs without presence, as you see a lot. I chimed in on this one a little bit just to talk about, you know, since 2004, there have been at least 200 departures. Uh, and so I count 10 to 12 every year. Uh, and once again, the same kind of issues Terrell is just bringing up in terms of the as to the mix of the challenges that are part of it. OK. Um, as you see, as a part of this conversation, then we're talking about um, how do we manage these limited fiscal resources, which is a part of the challenge. Uh, but then in this one, too, the conversation was board of trustees. And in this one, we're saying. There are fewer resources, so you sometimes have board members trying to make decisions that are expected of the president, and then there's a clash between the board and the president, and those are some of the challenges that we're seeing. So now people are talking about some of those issues in terms of governance. This is from a month ago, and part of my comments is a part of this article. Once again, I talk about the social media influence. I tell presidents, even if you aren't on social media, meaning you don't have a, a handle you're still on social media because people get talked about whether you, you're on it or not. So you still have to understand how it works and how it impacts you and your institution. So that's a challenge. Um, and so social media is easy because if we watch people every day distort the truth on social media and just out and out lie. So those are just some of the challenges that are part of it. Um, William Broussard it was interviewed because he also tracks some of the HBCU presidential turnovers and he leans more to the governance piece. The meddlesome boards he talks about the public board. So once again, this look at the Tennessee state situation where the governor just came in, wiped out a whole board, put in a whole new one immediately. Um, once again, it's just, you know, in many ways, unprecedented that we haven't seen like that before. A um, little bit different for private boards. You have a little bit more control, but that doesn't mean that it's always functioning well, as we see with the case with Morris right now, some of that that's going on. OK, so. Uh, back in the fall, I wrote a piece for the AJC, Atlanta Journal-Constitution, um, just talking about how do we make this better. But as a part of this, I wanted to look at um, some of the data. So I looked at departures from when I announced I was leaving Dillard uh, in the summer of 2021. And I looked at that period of time, about a two-year period of time. I took out the outlier, Dr. Harvey at Hampton, since he had been there 40 years. That would skew everything. So I had 32 institutions. Uh, and so if you look at it, that average, you know, which I said earlier, the, the average tenure is about the same as a 5.8 for ACE. It was about the same, but you got to dig into those numbers and you'll see some, some glaring uh, gaps in there, okay? Private schools were able to stay longer, six and a half to five, okay? So a little bit more stability with the private institutions. And I think particularly because of the political environment, the public space has become harder for people. Um, in many ways, the public space used to be a little easier because you knew 
you know, back in the day when you got a certain percentage of your budget from the state, but now you're getting less money from the state and more meddling. And so that becomes a challenge for a lot of people. Um, people who are HBCU grads fare better. So there is, I think, some value to people who have either worked or, or gone to HBCUs having at least a better understanding of what that environment is like. It doesn't mean that it can be perfect. There have been HBCU grads that have been gone in a year or two as well. So it's not. Uh, and, and being president of your alma mater could be a double edged sword because we've seen that as well. Um, but here you go. Men served almost three years longer than women. And that's one of the questions that we have to start asking to say, why is that gap so big? That's just the largest gap. Uh, as you see, Felicia Commodore mentioned that uh, this this uh, article just got published online uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I would have gotten it, but they said it was like fifty three dollars. And I, 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 I wait, I'll contact the author and figure out how I can get it for free. OK, but um, this is the question that we have to talk about, OK, that uh, she's digging in there. What the real crisis is, we've got this this gap in terms of sex and we've got to figure out what's going on with that. OK. Uh, but for my looking at those 32, experience was a big difference. If somebody who had been a president before or an interim at that institution, they serve four years longer than first time presidents. So there is a value of people having some experience going into these jobs, because going back to Chom Tom Chesney's point, that it's a different kind of mindset when you take these jobs. It's not just, oh, I'm going to be the president. It's a mindset. And I don't know if people... There are people who enter the job and they're happy to be the president, but I don't think they really understand what this means. Uh, there was a book written years ago by the former president of USC, Steve Sample. Um, and one of the chapters talks about, either, you know, not being the president, but doing president. And he talks about their very different things. I think he's exactly right. The book is called A Contrarian's Guide to Leadership. I want to remember that. So if anybody wants to look it up. It's a great read. Steve Sample, former president of USC. Um, but he talked about being president versus doing president. And that's what this speaks to, that there's still people who will get these jobs because they want to be the president. They don't want to do it. And today, doing president is even harder than when, when Sample wrote that book a decade plus ago. OK, um, so you'll see first time presidents and then first time presidents with no HBCU experience uh, last an average of four years. So once again, you're trying to learn a whole new culture and system and you're a new president. That's that's a heavy, heavy, heavy lift. And people should think about that um, before they jump into that. I always believe that uh, somebody who wants to be an HBCU president, that's not your background. You need to have worked at one before you become a president. I was very insistent. I was vice president for student affairs at Albany State at Georgia in Georgia before I became a president because I felt like I needed that experience before I could I could lead one. And that was definitely one of the best things I did. So. I just put that out there as a nugget. OK, so how do we start to fix some of this? So I've got some ideas for boards and I've got some ideas for aspirants. So let's start with boards. OK. The first thing, this is a mantra that I heard over and over again when I was president of Philander Smith College. It comes from Dr. Freddie Davey, who was an alumna of Philander Smith. She was dean of the Hampton Honors College, which they named after her. Um, she she died. I remember uh, right before my last board meeting at Philanda, she told me she had leukemia. She didn't have long to live. She was on program for commencement. She died a month later. And I'll never forget because the day we were moving to New Orleans was the day of her funeral. I was just sick that I couldn't be there uh, because she was she looked out for me. But she was like our sage on the board. When people want to overstep, she did not allow that to happen. And she always reminded board members, your job Nose in, hands off. We want to know what's going on and have the information, but don't you start meddling. And she felt like people were meddling, even in the board meetings, when questions she thought were out of line. She challenged everybody, including the board chair. And that's something that people don't talk enough about, because sometimes people will get on the board and they feel like it's my job to do these different things. And that's not their job. So people have to understand it's like they want to get the information, which this is uh, you know information for people who become presidents. A lot of times people aren't sharing information with the board because they feel like they have to fix everything. And I've never looked at boards like that. Your board is there to really help you. They should provide, they have different kinds of skill sets, but they these are some other people depending upon the size of your board, 10, 20, 30 people. They should be able to give you some different insight as you think about some of the challenges facing your institution or higher education or what's happening in your city, all those kinds of things. And so if you don't share information, that can create that tension as well. Uh, one of the things that I learned um, 
the former president of Syracuse, Bud Shaw, wrote a book and he talked about that he would do these updates for board members. And at both institutions I had, I did a monthly update, just some real basic information so they would know what's going on. If something, you know, crazy happened, of course, you let people know uh, immediately. Or if there was just some really great news, I sent out an email. But at least once a month, they heard from me. Like, here are the big things going on, you know. We're dealing with it. Here's a facilities issue we're keeping an eye on because we know there's some pipe issues in the city or whatever it is, you know, but it was always a mix of good news, things we need to work on, those kinds of things. You have to share the information so then you don't have board members who want to just dig into everything because they don't know. So but she was really good. So board members have to understand that is my role. Knows in. I need to know what's going on. I need the information, but I am not supposed to do the job. That's the your job is the. Hire, supervise, and fire the, fire the president. Those are the main things. So I think that's a good mantra for people to really remember that, okay? So that's, Dr. David taught me that. I, I believe that, okay? So they have to allow the presidents to do the job. And you hear sometimes when presidents are leaving, that becomes one of their major complaints. Even in some of the articles that I shared with you, people talked about those are some of the challenges, okay? Um, I, I can't tell you the number of times I've been in meetings, like a UNCF meeting, talking to colleagues, and you hear them complaining about boards, okay? It might be one of the top conversations that we have. So I'm giving you the insight that when, if somebody's just, the board is just in everything, it weighs on people. And I've seen it weigh on people in terms of that. Like I said, that that hasn't been my experience, um, but I've had plenty of conversations with people and then they'll complain about it. And then next thing you know, they're gone. Uh, because it was just either too much for them or the board decided to do something else, okay? The other thing we have to be ca careful, depending upon the nature of the board that I've watched, and I've, I heard um, an experienced president tell me this once before, is that sometimes boards will look for somebody who's inexperienced because they want to run the show. And that's not really good. So sometimes they won't, institution won't hire an experienced president because they really know what's going on. So if, you, if you're a board and you want to basically run the institution, you're not hiring me because I've been a president for almost 18 years and I'm on the White House board and all that, it, they're not going to fool with me, okay? Because I really know what I'm supposed to do and I understand my sector. Um, so sometimes people have to be careful about that, even if you're an aspirant, to say, is this a board that's going to allow me to be the president or are they hiring me to be a figurehead and they really going to try to do everything? And so that's got to be part of your analysis for people who are aspirants. But for boards have to be mature enough to say, how do we get the best person to lead our institution and not try to run it? Because once again, nose in, hands off. OK, so that's the, the first um, suggestion as a part of it. Point number two for boards is how do we use our exes? And not necessarily ex from your institution, but I'm talking about former presidents. I don't think we get enough um, usage out of people who have served in these roles because they can be extremely beneficial. Uh, you know, on a personal note, both institutions where I became president, they had an interim. The interim at both institutions were former HBCU presidents at Philander Smith, Julia Scott, who Dr. Scott had been president of Wiley and Payne. He was interim at Albany State and Augusta. I mean, Dr. Scott did like seven or eight of them. So, I mean, he was just notorious for those kind of interim presidencies and presidencies. But having somebody who was a very, very experienced president is my first presidency. And it's somebody that I was able to develop a relationship with that I could even ask questions years afterwards, invaluable. So I, he was he was very important to me. Same thing at um, at Dillard, the interim had been on the board. Jim Lyons, who had been president of Bowie and Jackson State and Cal State, uh, Dominguez Hills. Uh, Dr. Lyons, and I still have conversations about things. I mean, that's, that was just one of the best relationships I could have because he's somebody that has served multiple presidencies. He's like me, came out of student affairs like me. Um, he undergrad, predominantly white institution. So we had a lot in common. Um, but to have somebody like that who is the interim that then I could really bounce ideas off of uh, and then to have him on the board. So once he did his interim year, he came back on the board to have somebody on the board who was also a higher ed person who could validate. Sometimes the board members say, oh, I don't know about that. And then he could say, no, no, this is this is where things are. And because he had this long you know, experience in three presidencies, he carried a, a level of weight that I didn't have, but I, I really needed. And he would ask us hard questions, too, because he would tell us, I just don't want to hear the good news. Tell me the bad news, too. So I thought there was a lot of value in that. So I think every institution, and we talk about this at Dillard a lot to try to make sure we had at least a former president on our board. We thought that was important to be able to have. 
you've got to have ways to engage former presidents. I think there are a lot of different ways. So I think they could be a part of your board, but particularly when you're looking for a president, I think they should, every screening or search committee should have a former president. And part of the reason is sometimes they can help validate qualifications because you'll read things that people say they did in a role that if you understand their role, it was impossible for them to have done that. OK, I mean, you know, people embellish. They want to make it look good. I'm qualified for this job. We did X, Y, and Z. When the way that their role was designed, there was no way in the world they did that. So you need somebody who can ask different kinds of questions to really get at. Does this person have the skills that they say they have or is this just an embellishment? And so I think somebody who's been a president can dig a little bit different than somebody that who's a board member who's a lawyer or ad executive. They don't know that. They don't know what a dean does. They don't. I mean, they really don't know. So those are the kinds of things I think could be very, very helpful. How do we engage those people? And there is nothing to say you can't have um, a search for a position and have an outside, almost like consultant person. They don't have to be a member of your board, but they could be on your search committee because lots of search committees have community people. So why couldn't you have a higher ed expert on your search committee? I think we've got to do more than that because that'll help us. And then I think they could help that board think too differently about what's the landscape of what's going on, which leads to... Uh, the second point or point number three is how do we prepare for the president? And I don't think that boards and campuses do a deep enough dive to understand what's the what's the landscape? What's going on? So, I mean, the information I'm sharing with you now in terms of the nature of the presidency, I think before any campus hires a new president, there should be a presentation to say this is what's going on with presidents right now. This is a state of higher education right now. They need to understand that before they go into this search. And people don't. They just jump right into let's hire a president. Let's get a, you know, get a firm. Let's, and I know firms do some work, but I mean robust campus and board conversations about what's the landscape. Okay. Sometimes they need to really understand. Um, so as I said, training to understand the, vol um, the volatility. And then some campuses need to do a deep dive on their campus. If you're a campus that's had four presidents in the last decade, somebody needs to sit down and say, what's going on with us? Because you can't just say we, we missed four times in a row. OK, you have to say, what are we not doing? What what's going on here that's causing these presidencies not to be successful? And that that would be a really good conversation to have as well. So sometimes that's I mean, it, it's painful examining that. But I think that has to be part of it to say, what do we need to do differently? Because you can't be the place that every three or four years is hiring a new president and then act like that's normal because that's not normal. OK. And so this is the bonus. Pre board members really need to focus on helping to provide the resources. And that always gets lost because people it's easy to tell the president what to do. That's the fun stuff. It's harder to go out there or make the personal commitment to say, I'm going out and I'm raising several million dollars or I'm personally committing X percentage of my wealth for this institution. And we don't have enough of those conversations. You know, a lot of small private institutions, predominantly white institutions, when they do a capital campaign, they tell board members, we expect you to give X percentage of your wealth to this capital campaign. HBCUs, they just expect the president to go out and raise all the money and I'll be there for the photos. And it doesn't work like that. So there has to be some level of personal sacrifice. And we have to talk more about the boards. When people talk about fiduciary responsibility, it's not just checking the books. It's I am making a personal commitment using my personal resources to advance the institution. We have to have more of that. OK, so that's the bonus that boards have got to remember that that's a big part of what they have to do. OK. All right. So let's make the switch. I've talked a little bit about some things aspiring presidents should do, but let me add three additional ones, okay? The first is what I call understanding the key to life. And so this goes back to a conversation I had around 1997, 1998 with Elan Harris. I met Elan Harris, who is an author. Um, he spoke at Old Dominion where I was director of student activities. He had written this book called Invisible Life. And it's really like the first mainstream book that looked at uh, relationships with between gay men. Uh, when he first wrote the book, he was selling it out the back of his, his car, these rough paperback books. And the, the funny thing about it is that um, he did a book signing at a place where my mom was doing a book signing. And so she has one of the copies of the original books. Uh, Elaine Harris has since passed. And she has one of the original copies. So when he told me who he was and I was like, oh, wait a minute, my mom knows you, blah, blah. So he remember her and that kind of thing. So it was just a really interesting conversation. But as a part of his speech that night, he said, the key to life is to find something that you love doing that you would do for free and find a way to get paid to do it. 
And that has just stuck with me. Like, do you love the work that you do? I mean, it's sort of hard. People say, well, I want to be a president. It's like, yeah, but you don't really know because you haven't gotten there yet. So what are you doing in case you never become a president? Is it something that you love? And so for me, you know, you have to ask those questions. Uh, do you love what you do? Why or why not? And for me, I found it working in student affairs. And so I've done, you know, starting off in the residence halls and doing Greek life at Emory and, you know, orientation at Georgia State and, and student activities at Old Dominion and VP at, at um, Albany State before becoming a president. If I had just stayed in student affairs as a chief student affairs officer, I love that. And it's just, you know, being a president has been great. But I always tell people when I'm introduced, I'm not like, President's not who I am. I'm a student affairs professional. That's that's who I am. And so I found something that I love doing that I would do for free, working with student affairs and found a way to get paid to do it. So people have to think about that because there is no guarantee that you'll ever become a president. I keep reminding myself now, there is no guarantee that I will ever be a president again, even though I think I'm very qualified. And I watch people get presidents every day that are not as qualified, but I, I can't make somebody give me a job. So I might not ever be a president again. Uh, so do I love what I'm doing? That's I think that's very important. So that's the first thing. Just love what you do and do a good job at it. That can still be the goal. And you want to put yourself in position. And sometimes people think ahead to say, well, what do I need to do to get there? Love what you do right now and do that very well. Because if you find that, then I think other things can fall into place. OK. So as I said, you, you have no control. OK. All you can do is get nominated, be in a search but you don't know who's on the search committee. You don't know the politics that are involved. Like I said, you could be somebody, the third guy at Tennessee State that just got left hanging, okay? You, he has no control. He's completely out of his control because he doesn't know what's going to happen next, okay? So those are some of the challenges we have to think about, okay? But when we think about it then, and once again, this shows you in terms of the, um, the uncertainty of the process, it depends on who gets picked. You really don't know. So here's some, I did some, some additional digging. The last three years or so, and I looked at HBCU presidential selections. Okay, as Felicia Commodore mentioned, just the diversity: forty percent of the four-year sector people who were selected were women. So that's higher than you will see for most college presidencies. That's HBCUs are are doing better in terms of the people that we hire in terms of making sure women are having those opportunities. We're just failing in terms of making sure that they're successful. So we've got to have that that second part of the conversation. But it. it it follows what I was showing you earlier. People who are getting selected the most are, you know, 19, 19 of them were either interim or the president. So interim for a lot of places is almost becoming like your audition. It's like your audition. If you do well enough, you get the job. So we're leaning into that a lot. That's not to say that it always works. OK, but we're seeing a lot of that. And then your traditional, you know, provost position and then other VP. So. Three quarters of people who are being selected the last three years, they're coming from, you know, higher ed, senior leadership. OK, that's overwhelming. OK, you can sort of see what the average age is as young as 42, but even as old as 73. So you can see people in their 70s, even sometimes getting their first presidency. Um, but as of um, the end of 2023, you know, there still had been some attrition. OK, um, where you still had some in the job but you still had a number that are gone. So that's just not good. You shouldn't have that much attrition even after three years, okay? And the red flag is that 37 schools had picked people during that period of time. So once again, that's about, you know, 12, 12 schools a year, which I mentioned earlier, 10 to 12, okay? Six schools since 2020 have picked presidents twice, okay? Those are some of the challenges that we're seeing with that constant turnover. So as I talk about this, once again, and um, Bob Gass, they sent out these um, word of the day um, uh, meditation uh, and inspirational quotes. Uh, it just talked about that people who fulfill their calling exude an excitement and a connection to their gift that transcends fame. So they just found a way to get paid to do something they love. That's exactly what Elin Harris said. OK, so it's just something to think about. Really find something you love doing. Just really start with that. OK. Here's the hardest part then. Do you know no? Now, where does this come from? The, the woman on the left is Camelia Flanagan. She was, she's a Spelman graduate, and she was over part of the facilities at Emory when I worked at Emory 
with the whole housekeeping staff. She did housekeeping and all the interior design. Emory has some very well-appointed properties on campus. And when they wanted something done, the president, somebody, they called Miss Flanagan, she hooked it up. So all your housekeeping staff people reported to her. And we were in the same suite in residential services. I went to lunch with her every day. She was like my mom at work. Uh, so we talked a lot. So we were on this search committee for an area coordinator um, that the man on the right, Frank Gardner, took. And you see 30 years. Frank has been at Emory since we were there together. I started working at Emory in 92. So he came after me, which would have been maybe two years later. So, yeah, this is 30th anniversary. So we, we hired him in 94. and He's been there the entire time. But I remember sitting in Frank's interview with Miss Flanagan and she looked at him and she said, do you know? No. And I'm thinking, what is what does this mean? What is she going with this? And he looked at her and she said, you know, in these jobs, you got students who want this and want this. And sometimes people don't know. No. And when you don't know, no, it causes problems. And so being able to tell people no is important in a job like this, that you really have to know, no, to do this kind of job. She just went on and on about knowing no. So then she asked him again, do you know, no? And he said, yes. And I was just impressed because she went on and on and on about knowing no. But it's a powerful idea that do you know how to say no? And particularly when people get to this stage and somebody offers you and they say, we want you to be president or vice president of X, Y, and Z, it's hard to say no, okay? But you have to be able to say no. And you have to be able to reject the offer because sometimes, and I've watched people who've accepted something, just like, mm -mm, they'll be gone in a year or two. And every time I've said that, it's come true. It's just like, nope, it's not a good fit. Nope, do not do it. Nope, 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 okay? They didn't know no. But there should be some things that you think about to say, even if you get offered a position or you get into a search, you might get in a search and be a finalist. And I've been in a couple like this in the last year where I was named a finalist. I was just like, nope, it's not a good fit. I'm out. And sometimes it sounds crazy, but I just know it's like, no, this isn't it. It's just isn't it. Here are some reasons you might look at it. People don't think about this enough. Sometimes you have to think about geography and some of this is related to family issues. So for example, if you get offered a presidency in a place that's relatively rural or secluded where the schools aren't good and you have school-aged kids and the school would have to be an hour or so away, how does that work? OK, and I was in a situation like that where I was just like, I can't make the geography work because where the place was, my kids couldn't go to school there. It was just it's just unacceptable. We couldn't do that. OK. And so then how do you split your family up where they have to be, you know, driving back? It just that just went tenable. OK, so I had to say no based on geography, but I had to look at it and sort of see. So you got to think about that. How does it impact? You know, if you have a spouse, you have a partner, you know. How does that impact them? Is there's a place allow for them to be able to, to do whatever they need to do? Those are things you have to think about. Um, sometimes you have to say, this is just a bad job for me. It might be the dynamics of what's going on on that campus. Um, there was just one situation I was in. I was just like, I wish they would have set it up a little bit differently. The job could be good. But I thought that they needed to do some things before hiring a permanent president that they didn't want to do. Um, I, I argued they needed to have a long term interval and they didn't really want to do that. You know, it's so for me, I was like, uh, that's not the job I really want that they wanted right then and there. That wasn't a good fit for me. So I was like, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And then sometimes it's just a gut feeling. It might not be anything in particular. And like I said, it's hard, particularly if it's your first presidency, um, just to say, uh, no, I just don't know. Now, it's not to say that. A job can't be hard and it can be good. Like Philander Smith was a very hard job for me. Um, and I laughed my first week there. I started on December the 13th and um, I was going through papers. It was quiet on campus, Christmas break. I was going to be there a week, go home, pack, come back out. Um, going through just everything I could find. I was at an extended stay that Wednesday during lunch. I went home and laid down because my head hurt so bad because of the things I was finding. It was crazy. And so I met with the board chair that Friday before flying back to Albany. And uh, I told him, I said, man, y'all didn't tell me what was going on here. And he laughed at me and he said, yeah, because you probably wouldn't have come. And so it's one of those things where you just like, dang, I just, you know, my dad, my dad's a United Methodist minister. He was like, nope, that was your blessing. So I'm not saying a hard job can't be an opportunity. It could be a blessing for you as well. Uh, but there are sometimes there are jobs that you're just like, ah, something about this ain't right. And I need to let this go. And sometimes I think people don't um, listen to their inner voice. So 
you know, it's, 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 you know, it's not all just science and adding up different things and pros and cons. Sometimes it's a gut feeling too. So you got to think about that when you're an aspirant, just to say, ah, I, I just don't know. Okay. And like I said, it's hard. If you, you want to be a president, it's a, you know, first opportunity. It's hard to say no to that when somebody says, we're going to make you the president, but all of them are good. Every present opportunity is not good. And it's not good for you if it's unsuccessful because then, you know, you're the one that's in the news forever saying you were the failed president of X, Y, and Z. So you've lost something and that can be harmful to your career. So you have to think about that, okay? Um, point number three, study the board. You gotta know who am I going to be working with? Who are these people, okay? Um, so you wanna study, I always tell people, so I'm gonna give y'all the, the big secret is what I do. I read old newspaper articles for any place I'm interviewing and I will go back, it depends. Sometimes I've gone back like 34 years. I mean, I'll, I'll nerd out on that. But you can go back 10 years and just get a sense as to what's been going on. Have there been shenanigans going on? Those kinds of things. I think it's very important to study the board, know who's on the board. And then when you get on, you, you get a presidency, particularly at a private institution where you can help shape the board, you want to do that because you want to, you know, ideally use a matrix that you have different people with different skill sets that are part of your board and not just everybody's a lawyer or everybody's a doctor or whatever, politically connected. So you want to do those kinds of things. Um, but you want to know. And then I think boards should really and you should push them to do a check. Uh, I saw a situation once where there was somebody who was a badly behaving board at another institution and got put on another board and started behaving badly on that board, too. Had they done a simple Google search of that person, they would have seen that person was a badly be behaving board member somewhere else. So why would you add them to your board? Because as soon as they got on there, they started some problems at that institution. OK, so you, you got to know who those people are when you have a chance. Now, like I said, if they're gubernatorially appointed. You don't really have much of a say, even though I think even for state institutions, um, I think presidents or somebody from the board, they should get with the governor and say, we know that you pick who, who you want to. At least here are some skill set areas that we think would be helpful for our institution. And even ask, is it do we have an opportunity to suggest some people to consider? I would explore all of that. I just wouldn't say, well, the governor gets to pick. I mean, the governor does, but you should at least ask to say, can we have a role in that? At least these your skill set areas or professional expertise or even particular people. I would at least make the, the offer to try to figure out because I think those are key. You got to have really good board people. But before you start, you need to see what the board is, if they've had a lot of turnover, if they've had turmoil on the board, you need to know all of that, okay? Uh, particularly for public boards now, you can go back and watch their board meetings. And so you can sort of see, are they, you know, having collegial meetings and very thoughtful, or are they just in there, you know, hollering and screaming at each other? And sometimes you can find, I've watched board meetings of people doing exactly that. Um, so those are things that you have to think about. OK. Here is um, some thoughts about boards from the legendary Janetta Cole. Um, and I want to share these with you. What are the lessons? What do you say to that individual about working with and managing that board? I really can say that I think my two experiences were a bit atypical. And what I mean by that is that while neither board at any stage of the 10 years at Spelman or the five years at Bennett were perfect boards, they sure were good boards. And they got to be better boards over time. If you've got a good board, there's hardly anything that you can't do. And a good board to me means a board that understands the difference between their responsibility and the responsibility of the president and the management team. A good board means that everyone around that table without any exception understands their responsibility to contribute substantially in financial terms to that institution. A good board means that you have got in every single person around that table a polished ambassador for your school. And so when I... Okay, so I, I think that uh, Dr. Cole you know, sums up what I've been trying to share as a part of that. 
really quickly get to this last point, and we don't think about this a lot. This is interesting. Uh, it's, these are stressful jobs. Th these are really stressful jobs. They're hard jobs. Um, and there was an article um, that uh, President Kington wrote about, uh, who was a doctor, actually. And he just talked about some of the, you know, physical challenges he had in terms of, you know, being a, a president and some of those kinds of things that he really fought, um, he dealt with. So some of the things he argued then is that, you know, you have to guard your health, your friendships, find a career coach and a therapist, your stress uh, relief toolkit and get help if you need it. Like, like for me, you know, it's working out every day, particularly when I was, I've been down for a little bit recently, haven't been able to get my workout back going, but uh, it's working out every day. That just helped me just to clear my head and just feel good. And the energy you get from that is just, you know, I look forward to that. It just gives me some balance, but we don't talk openly enough about protecting our own health and that can do a lot of damage too. So you don't want to kill yourself doing these jobs, but you got to learn how to balance those kinds of things with the stress and because the job has gotten harder. So it's just something else to think about as well. Um, those of you who are aspiring to be a president, you, you know, make sure you, you know, you can look at uh, mentors, but some people say get a sponsor. This book, um, Herman Felton at Wiley put me onto this. There are a set of two books. Um, and he uses it with his um, higher education, Le higher education leadership foundation um, group, and they talk about that. But having some sponsors, particularly as you start thinking about it, you know, those people who really are pulling for you and making things happen. Mentors are good; they can provide different advice, but that sponsor really sets you up to do those kinds of things at a different level. Um, they really invest in you. So those are really good. And then what you really want to start thinking about is that you want to be open to what I call a shepherd. Um, Charlie Nelms is that person for me. He's just a person that's just looking out for me, who just call out the blue, how you doing? That's why I keep telling people, I want to get to that part of my career where I can do what, what Charlie does and be that person who's looking out for other presidents uh, so when you get in that role that you're the person that's checking on people because you've retired, you've done everything you need to do, but you're looking out. So that's what, you know, I'm trying to move to that next phase to be able to, to do those kinds of things. So hopefully you become a president, you know, you have your sponsors, but then at some point you definitely want a shepherd. You want to have a developer. And it's not something you go out and look, you really develop a relationship. Um, and so that's very important. So the final thing I'll share, this is a piece from Wayne Frederick. He spoke at the Wilder Symposium at uh, Virginia Commonwealth. And he lays out the issues with boards and some of the transitions, everything. And of course he could speak freely at this time because he, he had retired. But I want you to listen very closely because I think he says some very important things as part of his, his statement here. Is one of the most critical things for our HBCUs. Why do I feel that way? When I started my presidency, the average tenure for university presidents in this country was about nine years. Today, it's down to 5.6. For HBCU presidents, it's down to 2.8 years. Think of what type of leadership for a complex institution like higher education institutions are, can even find the closet in 2.8 years. Far less solve the most complicated problems an institution might be facing. And that leadership problem goes to governance as well. And governance is a very misunderstood issue at our higher education institutions. Our institutions are like cars. The president is the driver and has the steering wheel. The board of trustees are sitting in the back seat and they are to provide guidance as to whether or not you turn left or you turn right. When you stop at a gas station, they're there to get better gas for you, premium preferably. They're there to help you change the tires, get a new carburetor. What they are not there to do, but what they often do in HBCU world, because they don't have access to the resources, but they are good operators, they tend to want to operate the car. And what happens? They pull the steering wheel. What happens when somebody pulls the steering wheel if you're driving? You're gonna pull it back and you're gonna get in an accident. And so those accidents occur frequently. So I would argue that one of the key solutions for our HBCUs to thrive as we go into the future is to take a hard look at leadership. Harvard University and its past 10 presidents have had one president unwillingly not serve 10 years. One. 
and you all know him, Larry Summers said something very inappropriate and as a result ended his presidency. The point is that when those well-resourced institutions pick leaders, they get behind them and they stay with them for those 10 years because that stability of leadership in and of itself brings a certain success. What do we do in HBCU world? We say that guy has an accent. He wasn't born here. He doesn't understand the culture. I came here as a 16 year old, and I don't think you could get a better education of black American life than on Howard University's campus. But yet still, we spend so much time in our HBCU community criticizing our presidents as opposed to supporting them that we create a dynamic that does not breed success. And I'm here to tell you that that leadership and governance is a key aspect of what we must do differently as we go. In 100 years at Howard University, we have not transitioned the presidency well. We celebrated our 150th anniversary in 2017. Not a single living past president attended. Think of how storied an institution Howard University is. Not one single past president, not one of my successors, attended a single ceremony on that campus to celebrate the 150th anniversary because they all left unwillingly. They all left unhappy. And that should never happen. So I'm here to tell you, I left willingly. <clears throat> I left happily. I have not stopped smiling since I left. And I have transitioned. Okay, so I thought that was a very good way to sort of sum it up in terms of even when you look at the Mecca, and, and I think Dr. Frederick does a really good job of sort of encapsulating the challenges we've had with governance um, as a whole. But, you know, I think there are some things that we can do differently. I think there are some great opportunities that um, we have to do things differently uh, with our institution. So um, with that, we will open it up and see what kind of questions you all have, uh, and we'll go from there. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Walter. Just really, really good stuff. And we have tons of questions and I know that you love questions. So I'll just start asking some lots and lots of different things. So the first one is um, in the case with TSU, where is the outrage from alumni and donors? Um, this is how many institutions use their influence. What do you have to say about that? I, I'm I'm dumbfounded. I am literally dumbfounded because as I explain to you, I, I keep going back and I look every day to say, have they had another? I mean, they had a rally with students right when all this was happening. I think it was that Wednesday when they started the search process. They had um, Reverend William Barber came. Roland Martin was there. Um, uh, a, a number of people. I mean, so they did it, you know, in the but that, that's been it. So once the whole board was wiped out and they stopped the search. As I said, crickets, that's what the slide said. I have no idea. It, it is amazing to me that people have not put pressure. So, and, and particularly, and I, I looked ahead, their new board will meet on Friday and they posted the agenda. And will you believe on the agenda, there is nothing about the presidential search? It's not even mentioned. So I don't know. I don't know if they've just given up to say we've lost and we're just, I, I don't know. But I think people there should be asked like, what are y'all doing? <laughs> what, this, is, this is an important institution. And everybody just went radio silent. They were loud and rowdy for a while, but they're quiet now. So I, I keep looking every day because I'm waiting for something to happen. But uh, that's a great question. <laughs> you should ask some alums, like, what are y'all doing? I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Um, here's another. Uh, what are tips to discern whether someone can do the presidency as opposed to wanting to be the president? And I love this discussion because... As you know, and I know, there are so many people who who really just want that shine of the yes. presidency, and they have no clue just how hard that work is. And if you're around any HBCU presidents, you know that typically they're physically exhausted yeah. and also just, I mean, just presidents in general, but it is a really difficult position. So what are some, what are some tips? How do you decide who can do that? And can you just tell when you talk to someone? If I could... I don't see. Well, part of it is I, I would dig a little bit harder into um, their background and what they've actually done. 
Um, so this might be a little controversial. I had a conversation with a, a headhunter who was breaking it down to me. I was telling Mary Beth's group last week this, um, that the, the pathways are drying up because fewer presidents want to do another presidency. Fewer provosts want to be presidents. And so now a lot of that pool is coming from deans. And he argued that a dean is not an executive level person. And I agree because a dean is not at the big table every time when you're dealing with every issue on campus. If I'm dean of arts and sciences and the power goes out, nobody's calling me at the house and say, come, let's figure this out. What are we going to do about feeding the students tonight? You're at the home chilling. OK, <laughs> you know, you don't. And so for some people, that's a bigger lift. So you have to make the, you know, try to figure out, do they really understand the nature and the complexity of what I'm about to get into, which sometimes people don't. So you have to try to figure out ways. How do we ask questions to say, you know, do you understand the level of commitment and the complexity of what's going to happen and just the physical strain? I don't know if it's something that you can, I, I don't know if people can really even imagine what it's like. Um, you sort of have to get in and figure it out. You have to know if you have the, the mindset to be able to do it. Like I said, for me, I came up through student affairs. So my first job at Emory, this is way back in the day, we shared a pager. I shared a pager with the four residence life area coordinators. The week you had a pager, you didn't sleep because it was always somebody going to the hospital, alcohol. It was this. It was sexual. Assault. It was something that week you did not sleep. So I came in a higher ed working at least, you know, once every five weeks with a crazy schedule. So when something happens with me and I'm a president and you get an email saying David Duke is coming to campus, you're like, oh, hell, let's just make it, you know, you just make it work. You just do what you have to do. There are people who when those things hit, they have no idea what to do because they've been in that silo. And particularly, I'm not picking on my academic colleagues, but, you know, Mary Beth, if I've only taught my classes and been in, I don't have to come back at night. And if there's a protest on campus, I just walk home and nobody's calling me. It's a different responsibility when you're the person which is what some of these presidents are dealing with now. They're dealing with the protests on campus because they're not used to just dealing with it. Like I said, student affairs person, I've been in a fraternity house kicking people out and they were cussing us out. I've seen ugly from day one. So it doesn't, it doesn't throw me off like that. So I don't think there's an easy way that you can tell, which is why I try to put a lot on people who are aspirants to be honest with themselves. And like, do you really want to do this job? Or like Mary Beth said, and unfortunately there are people that be like, I want to be the president. And they get into jobs and they think people are supposed to be subservient to them. And those are the people that get right in trouble and get kicked out. Uh, so I, I try to get aspirants to ask themselves hard questions because in the end, if you're that person and you fail, not only have you harmed the institution, you've harmed yourself. And it's better to know like, ah, you know what? I'm not really cut out to do this job. Let me just keep doing what I'm doing. I wish more people were honest with themselves, but there is this allure to being a president. It's, it's, sex it's still sexy. You know what I'm saying? It's, and on a lot of campuses, you know, people, oh, the president, blah, 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 and people trying to do all kinds of things for you. And people like that. Uh, and that's just not good. So good question, but there isn't a simple answer. Okay, great, great. So another question about uh, TSU, um, you know, being, of course, shortened a billion dollars and because they're a land grant institution, you saw several national investigations of that. And also Adam Harris's work, the state must provide talks yeah. about it as well. I think Susan Adams at Forbes as well. Um, so this question is why aren't uh, Thurgood Marshall, NAFIO, UNCF joining their resources to help the universities get funding that they need to be successful and, you know, in, in, uh, kind of supplementing that lack of money yeah. uh, or going after that. Right. And um, they're, they're commenting that HBCUs are too tuition dependent. Of course, the majority of institutions in the nation are tuition dependent, but HBCUs tend to be really tuition dependent. Right. Yeah. So I don't know the calculus that's, and I haven't thought about it. So for example, I don't know what the calculus is for Thurgood Marshall, not leaning into that because most of those schools are Thurgood Marshall member institutions. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I have to look, I'm, I'm just, they haven't, they may have written something, but they haven't really weighed in publicly. Now I know, and I've had some conversations with a state representative in Tennessee. Um, I know one of the things they are doing is looking at the Maryland case. So people are looking at that, but the thing that, and Mike Jones, who led the Maryland case, who was the board chair at Dillard, he says, what people don't, he said, it's hard because people have contacted him. He's like, I want to do another one like that. He said, cause it was a 12 year process. So people feel like, oh, we sue, we get money tomorrow. It took 12 years. So that's not a quick solution. You hope that you could get states to do the right thing. But in certain states, they're just like, no, I think we're good. We're not doing this. The politics play in. Uh, so there needs to be some additional pressure to do that. Um, but that's a good question. I, 
I, I just don't know what the calculus is at Thurgood Marshall because they would be a little bit more neutral. They could say some things and push away that Tennessee State as an institution couldn't uh, and maybe get with Nafio to push to, to do some of that. But that hasn't happened, and I don't know why. Good question. I, I just, I don't know. It's a yeah, good really, question. really good question. Yeah. Uh, so here's a question about women. Um, the person says for women, especially black women to be successful in presidential roles, they need support. Can you speak to issues of support and how do women advocate for support from their boards without appearing needy or that they don't know what they're doing? So it's the, the challenge, the fundamental challenge for women was explained to me. Um, when I first got to Diller, um, I pulled together a group of HBCU presidents who were I guess when I got here, I was, so I turned, I turned 57 on Monday. So y'all can still send gifts. I turned 57 on Monday. Um, so maybe I was 43, 45 when I got here. Um, and there were a number of presidents that were coming up who were young, who had school age kids. And I said, you know, we should get together every now and then. We would meet at White House Initiative and just have dinner. But, I, you know, we had a, a one day retreat here in New Orleans and I had about eight people come. So we could just talk about, you know, being a young president and some of the challenges. And we talked about with spouses. And I had my wife come who's worked in higher ed. And Rosalind Clark already was, was there. She told us, she said, Sister President, your challenge is for a woman who's a president, you have to be the president and the first lady because that's how people treat. And so there's a different level of burden that people still expect them to have first lady. Like, and I saw Rosalind recently, she said, I'll never forget. She always, she said, I'll never forget what Adrian told me because that has been her experience. It's a, it's a different kind of challenge. So, but there is some support that's needed, but there is this mindset that people have when they see a woman president that she's also the first lady. So it's trying to help people understand. I mean, if you're at a place like Spelman, you don't have that, but other places I think you do. So how do we help boards understand that this person is the president full stop and the kinds of things that they need to be successful? But there is a, a thing, particularly for boards that and I, there have been studies of board composition. I think they're probably still overwhelmingly men. There is a level of sexism that's still occurring in boards, which causes some of this. And we just need to call it for what it is. It's just pure sexism that they're not getting the same level of support. People expect different things for them, a different level of uh, engagement than they would a male president. Uh, that's just not fair. We've got to have people who are calling that out and getting boards to be more sensitive to that so that it's not the president just fighting. We, we hope you would have somebody enlightened on the board to say, OK, are we treating this president the right way? Because that's where it really needs to come from, because I think you're right. If it comes from that president, they're going to be like, woman president, she can't, you know, she can't do the job. I, I think you're right. So you've got to have some enlightened people who are raising those questions and say, we need to make sure this person has everything that a male president would have it. We we've done a I just we've done a horrible job. I think supporting um, women presidents and having those kind of conversations. But I think part of it is our initial notion is that I think people still and some of this is. I mean, you just think about if we think about you know black culture. Uh, that's why there's still overwhelming number of churches have men as ministers because people when they think about leadership in, in black communities, it's that male. I mean, it's just a deeper conversation. I'm a preacher's kid, so I'm just telling you what I what I see. Uh, it's a deeper conversation in terms of black communities and how we view leadership and gender and leadership in black communities. So that's I think if we expand it out, that's the conversation we need to have. And what we're seeing happen to these women presidents is a symptom of that. But it's black communities and leadership and gender. Thanks. Um, this next question is really interesting. Um, something I've personally written a lot about. Uh, it says, I'm a second doc, uh, second year doctoral student in higher ed at College of William & Mary. I wanted to know if you think the infamous case study, the American Negro College by Jenks and Reisman, still affects how HBCUs are being led today. So for people who don't know, that was a really big deal for a long time, uh, Not especially when I first was a, a younger professor. Yeah. I don't hear about it as much anymore. But Yeah, and it was, you know, I've done presentations. I noted it because it was 1967, the year I was born, the year that Benjamin Mays retired from being uh, president of Morehouse. Um, and the year I think Reagan was governor, he really started pushing a lot of this uh, education as a private good. It was like in 1967, there were like four or five similar events. I've tried to do a presentation to link them all together. And this is one of them. Um, so, you know, if, I, I would encourage you all to read it if you haven't read it. But I mean, it's just really this you know, racist notion of these academic disaster areas. And after it was written, I think Mary Beth is 
pull this together. A number of presidents wrote pieces that really push back. Um, Albert Dennett Diller was one of the people who wrote the pushback as well. Um, you know, I think some people believe some of those things, but within the last five years, there have been a number of articles and research that has come out that's given you some uh, data about the value of an HBCU experience. So like the Strata data that they've done, or the Gallup-Purdue data. Uh, there have been studies about um, HBCU attendance and health and uh, lots of different. So I think there are some things that balance some of that out that we didn't have before. Um, so I don't think as much, like I said, Mary Beth said, most people probably don't even know the, the Jinx and Reisman study as much. But there, I mean, of course, there are people who feel like they're inferior institutions. But I think there have been some third party um, research that's been done to balance some of that. I've just seen more of that in the last decade, which sort of helped. So, you know, I, does that sentiment exist? I think it does exist to a degree, but I think there's we have more to balance it out than we would have had in 1967. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, here's a great question. When you found something you love in higher ed and you're doing the work, beginning to develop your expertise, how do you get your name in a room where you currently don't have a seat in it? Um, is, so I think if you keep doing the, the work that you're doing and, you know, particularly if you're out and you're, um, you know, giving presentations and just some of those other things, that's when you hope you have those sponsors. If somebody has met you along the way, they see your work and they they mention you and you'll just find out that somebody met you. So you might even know who that person is. So you you want to keep doing the work. I think people do pay attention to people who are doing work and they'll ask about so and so. I think that's the way that you can do it. Now, I mean, you will have mentors as well that you work with and they'll do some of that. But that's when a sponsor comes in, that you want to develop those kind of relationships, that there are people who are actively trying to help you advance your career. Uh, but still look at them first as relationships. Sometimes people just out the cold blue will say, well, so and so can be my mentor. Like for me, that doesn't work because I want to have a relationship. It's got to be somebody that I just really get to know. And, you know, that kind of relationship develops and not just something that's transactional. Um, so you, you want to develop those relationships, but, you know, hopefully it becomes a sponsor where there's somebody who is mentioning you in those rooms and putting you up for certain things. Um, but it just starts by doing the work and you get your name out there. And, uh, you know, I, I think about Mary Beth. I don't know how, you know, you just started to blow up, but you start reading about Mary Beth. And I know she came and did something for me and Philander Smith. It's like, man, she's right. She's doing all this. Let me find out who this person is and get her to that's you just saw the name. And she was the person doing the writing. And it was, you know, she's doing the interviews. And I'm like. Well, let's see what she had to say. And then she came and interacted with us. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is great. So that's, you know, you just doing the work. And so she, just because of the volume of work that she's done, she's been able to do that. So I think if you do the work and you do it consistently, you'll be able to, to make that happen. Um, but, you know, find good relationships along the way. That That's going to be very helpful. I just think that's very important. Yeah. And I would encourage people to ask if there's someone you want to be your mentor or to make those introductions or get to know, ask. I mean, as my mom told me when I was little, all they can do is say no, right? right. And then you can kind of move to the next person. Say. So here's a great question. Please share at least three administrative roles that could lead to being appointed a president and why? Oh, I think there are lots of, I think there are lots of roles. I wouldn't, I wouldn't limit them by role. Um, and we've seen people from all kinds of roles and backgrounds, uh, people who could be uh, president. So it didn't have to be those traditional um, administrative roles on the campus. I, I would just say I think it's important for somebody to have been at a senior level position like a VP if you're coming from inside higher ed, because if you're at the table and you hear all the different issues that are happening, I think that gives you an advantage versus somebody who has not heard all the issues. It's just it's different. I mean, you could be the, the legal counsel. You're at the table. So you've heard about the academic issues, the student, just just being aware of the day to day issues. You're working with contracts when you have facilities issues. That could be a really good position. So I just think that someone who has been at that level, um, I think is very important. So I wouldn't necessarily identify it by role, but I would say somebody who has had if you're from inside higher ed that you've had, you know, that senior level experience. I, I, I just think that's very important. So there are a bunch of questions in here related to um, your comment about how um, chief academic officers and some like provosts are are not as interested in being presidents anymore. And so some of the comments have to do with um, if they're not interested, where are people going to yeah. come from? And what do you think about people coming from outside of education? How are you feeling about that? Can yeah. they can they lead? So this is so. That was so the the 
the search, the, this guy works for a major um, search firm. So let me expand on what he said. So he said, presidents don't want to do it anymore. Senior presidents, so they're less. Provosts are looking at it because they're right next to it. And they're just like, no, nah, you can't have that. Let me just keep doing it. So they don't want it. He says the next area that people are going to are VPs for research, which mm -hmm. I thought was interesting. So he said, you're going to see more people who are looking at somebody who is a vice president for research. Now you think about like some of the HBCUs now that are trying to get to R1. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised. And I have no inside track on this. So I'm just speaking, just thought North Carolina a is looking for a chancellor. I wouldn't be surprised if their next person had been a VP for research. Now, if it happens, somebody should like be like me. He's like prophetic. But I wouldn't be surprised yeah. because they want to get to R1. They're real close. So to have somebody with that kind of background wouldn't be surprised. So he said that's where he said that's the people are, are picking people with the research background because they still want a VP level person. But they think the research could be really good. And then they're going to the deans. But like I said, his caveat, he just feels like the deans. That's not a senior level position. So they're coming in a little bit handicapped to be able to do what needs to be done. Um, so that was his, like I said, the way he broke it down for me. He felt like that's what he was seeing. Um, but the overall challenge is he feels like the people who are on the search committees really are not doing a good job. They don't really know what to look for. And a lot of times they miss people who are really good. So he gave me an example of somebody who was really trying to place who was really, really good. This guy was like in five or six searches in California. Nobody picked him. Somebody finally picked him. And then one of the presidents at one of the schools where he was in the search contacted him to say, man, we want somebody like this. He was like, he was in your pool. He was in your pool. But the search committee didn't really understand. Like the guy was a superstar. They didn't see it. They just didn't know what they were looking. And so that's a challenge. You When you're in a search, it, it depends on who's in the room. And, and do you have, as he told me, a champion in that room where somebody really sees what you can do? And like, this is our person. Mm -hmm. um, so it, the search committees, you know, they, they get the first crack at it. And if they, you know, send the board three or five people and they miss out on some really good people, nothing you can do. But he was, he just felt like the search committees are doing a horrible job, which is why one of my things I said, if a search committee has somebody who was like a seasoned president, they could tell people like, y'all are crazy. This person right here is great. Mm -hmm. They, they miss that kind of voice. So you just got people on campus and they, they can say what they want and what they think. But they don't really understand the landscape of higher ed. They don't really understand what it means to be a president. They don't have a clue. None of them have been a president. So you got people who've never done the job trying to say this person's going to be the best person to do a job that they know nothing about. Yeah. It, yeah. That sounds crazy. And I mean, it's like, that's absolutely crazy. It It is too. And there's a question that's really interesting that said higher, is one, higher ed is one of the few industries that allows external people to hire the top leadership positions without any knowledge of the industry. Lay people don't get to hire banking CEOs no. or hospital CEOs. What can be done about that? And I mean, I have to say that as, you know, I serve on two HBC boards and I've served on other boards as well. And it's very interesting that the majority of the boards have no higher education experience. And um, and it, it, I find myself explaining how yeah. higher education works, right, to people. So can you comment on that? I mean, it is very interesting. Yeah, it's right? right, but that's, but see, so for them, those institutions having you on their board, that's the kind of advantage where she can look at something as a board member and say, no, that's not what that means. That's not what they've done, blah, blah, blah. And you, like I say, every time I look at a, a job that's open and you look at, see who's on the search committee, they don't have higher ed people on there. They don't. They just, these people on the campus, they might say, well, this is what we want, but they really don't know if that person has the ability or have, has a background or track record to do that job. Uh, and so that is, that's a major flaw in how we select presidents. And which is why, like I said, I just really wish every search committee had some kind of higher ed professional, like I said, preferably a, a president, but if you had if you had a distinguished scholar like Mary Beth, that would be good. Somebody who is studying HBCUs to help you hire HBCU president, that makes a lot of sense. We're not, we're not making a lot of sense with these things. And so that becomes one of the reasons you see this turnover. We we've done a horrible job. So um and then just going back, somebody said in terms of the people outside higher ed, I mean I think those can work too. It just depends. There isn't anything um necessary to say it can't work. I've seen it both ways. Um you know, Hampton's new president, he was very involved as a student. He was a general, uh, but, you know, very involved as a student. His wife was Miss Hampton. So that's so far has worked out really good for them. Uh, but then sometimes people from out, you know, come from corporate. They try to run it corporate. They get run out of there because everybody's yeah. like, no, we're not doing that either. So it, like I said, it it's not a silver bullet. Sometimes people feel like we need the corporate person, uh, but I don't think you necessarily do. Um, so that's part of it, too. 
So here's a really, here's a positive question. Um, what, what was one of your greatest memories from being an HBCU president? That's a hard question. Um, I'm gonna go with my last greatest memory at um, Dillard. Uh, a student that I was really close to her, all of her years, she came, she had been homeless. So when, when students get connected with you like that, and they always text you and you feel, you know, it's like, man, I'm having trouble with this rent. I'm like, yeah, no, that means I'm having trouble with this rent. Um, so you just, but she, she didn't want to tell me she got pregnant right before she graduated. And she told my wife. And so she finally told me, and I said, when is the baby due? And then the baby was due on graduation day. I was like, mm, first baby's not going to make it that long. That baby's coming before that. No, uh, we're going to have a plan. I, I got to walk that stage because it meant a lot to her. And so it got closer too. And so the doctor said, well, you might be able to make it to walk across the stage and then we'll induce after that. I said, okay, well, we'll adjust the program. So if I let you walk first, so I can get you up out of there because I don't want you outside. It's hot. And, you know, it'd be great my last graduation, but to have a baby on the stage might be too much for everybody. So we're not doing that. So at about five o'clock that morning, she texts me saying I went into labor. So she was going to miss graduation. So I announced to the classmates, Jada hope to be here, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I knew it meant a whole lot to her. So I told my wife, like, we're going to the hospital tomorrow to give her, her her degree. And so I took my gown and brought one of the little graduation the degree covers. And of course, when we got to the room, she had her robe ironed, her honor stoles. She And so we reenacted that part where you cross the stage in the hospital room the day after she had the baby. And that thing went viral like I've never seen before. She was on Good Morning America. We were on all the news because it's just one of those things. People just like, wait a minute, the college president went and gave a degree in the hospital. I was like, yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. It was like for me, it was like I said, I'm, I'm a preacher's kid. I was like, yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. What else am I supposed to do? Because I knew the way that she talked about it, I was like, you better take your role because this is what this if I had just showed up there just to say, hey, and I saw that robe there, she would have been so disappointed. I was like, nope, you take your role. You bring your script. Because you need to do this ceremony in this for this girl because you know it meant a lot to her. And knowing her whole backstory, uh, I'll never forget that because I just, when it's just started to blow up, I had people all over just saying like, I can't believe the president did this. And I was like, yeah, that's what I do. It was like, to me, it was like, it was regular, but people made a big deal out of it, which just shows you sometimes if, if you're interested in just being the president, that doesn't register with you. But to me, that was part of doing the job. It was more than that. It was like, this was meaningful for this, this student. Yeah. And knowing the backstory, it was like, this is what you do. So yeah, it's Sunday. It was like Sunday after church. And I'm like, what time can we come? When the, When's visitation? All right, we'll be there. And so I'll never forget that. Um, like I said, it was just a, a fun moment to be, but just how people responded to was really interesting to me. So that's oh. I yeah. love that. I love that. You got me tearing up over here, though. Oh that's yeah, so you can, you, look, you can find it if you look somewhere. <laughs> the, the president of the degree, you'll you will find it. It just it was literally everywhere. It was crazy. It really was, but it was fun. Uh, I, I love that. Thank you, thank you. Um, so there are lots of questions about dealing with um, if you're president, how do you deal with a toxic board member or? Let's say you don't get along with your chair or I know those are two very separate things, but how, you know, I've been on boards where there have been board members who really act up and have yeah. their own um, interest in mind rather than the institutions or like you said, want to run the school. It's strategically as a president, what would you recommend as, you know, a move to be able to work through that? And is it even possible? Yeah. I, so like I said, I'm, I don't have good experience with that. The, the closest I had when I first got to Philander, the, the board chair that hired me was rolling off. So the new board chair came in. He was along. The previous president didn't want him on the board. So he had a little bit of a chip um, on his shoulder, but he wanted to run the school. And so he and I would butt heads a little bit. Dr. Davey, who I showed you, would step in and be like, nope, you can't do. So she was protecting. So it was it was rough for about a year just trying to. And so then we had the situation, we had these two alums in Gary, Indiana that died. They were in their 90s. And we went to the funeral. So we flew to Chicago, drove to Gary. We spent a day together. And I'll never forget it because it was a day of the Virginia Tech shooting, actually. We got back to the, the airport and they were shooting at Virginia Tech. I'll never forget it. But spending that day with him, we got on the same page. And then the whole thing changed. So it was for, for us, it was just spending the time together. And I, like I said, for him, it was, this school is really in trouble. I need to do something to fix it because this is my school. And I'm a new, like I said, when I was hired, I was 37. So he's probably thinking like, you got this young president. He don't really know what to do. So he had to have build some trust into me like, okay, 
I understand he got it and I understand my role, but it took us a year to get there for him to feel comfortable. And then after that, we were good. And then the next chair that came on was a bank president. So, you know, he knew how boards work. That was easy. OK, but I haven't been in a situation, knock on wood, where I've had to deal with that toxic board, which is why I always tell people in advance, try to really see. I mean, I've I've been up for positions where you could see board meetings and you could watch board meetings and you could watch the toxicity and you mm -hmm. just like, no, you can't go work there. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. Um so if there's an opportunity to do that, then you would have to be able to do that as well. But when you're in the thick of it, I don't have a good, like I said, I've never experienced it. And I don't have a good idea as to how you deal with it. I don't. I really, yeah, it's I interesting. don't. That's a hard question. Yeah. When you're on the board, one thing you can do is that you can speak up and yeah. you can make sure that, you know, you, you, um, uh, you you speak up on the important issues and and sort of redirect conversation, but it's definitely um, definitely hard for a president. So I'm, we've got time for one more question. I'm going to kind of combine a bunch of questions, which okay. we have so many questions. Every time we have you come, we have so many questions. So um, so the question is, there's questions about um, where where is the training ground for successful HBCU presidents, and what events can we attend to continue this narrative? push the needle forward. Lots of questions about how you know if you'll fit, how 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 you get in the door. Um, what, what do you think? So, I mean, like I said, there are lots of training programs. Mary Beth does one. Health does one. Ask you does one. But the thing I keep telling people for HBCUs, I'm not as concerned about the training of the aspirants, because if you can train somebody, if they go into a toxic situation with a toxic board, the training doesn't matter. You can throw that out the window. They're, that's not going to help you deal with that. We've got to find ways to put pressure, which is something I really want. Like, a, you know, I would love for UNCF to tell all the UNCF member institutions because they get money from UNCF to say we're having mandatory training for board chairs and board members and a certain number of your board to come and say, here's a landscape. This is what's going on. This is what we need you to do. They have been unwilling to do that. But just with the number of turnover, UNCF should say, we're trying to raise a billion dollars. And if we have all this turnover and all this drama, it hurts what we're trying to do. So not only do you hurt your institution, you're hurting everybody else. We need you to get together. They, nobody has been willing to do that. I, I, once again, we can you can train everybody, get them prepared. But if you just dump them into this toxic success pool, it doesn't matter. So I think that's what we've got to figure out. How do we start putting pressure on training and doing better job with boards and board development, because that's, if we can get the board piece right, then I think we can get some the other piece right as well. Um, but like I said, there are plenty of opportunities for training and, and really good programs that's out there, but you can be well-trained and you get into a crazy board and then it's sort of like, ah, I really don't know how to deal with this. Cause that's, I mean, they can talk about, oh, Mary Beth, I don't know how much you talk about boards, but I don't know, you, you don't have a session called, you have the board from hell, what do you do? We don't, but we're starting a um, a new series that'll have five uh, national sessions related to board president relationships. And, you know, maybe I'll call you and uh, yeah. get a few other people to talk about what you do with that, because uh, we just got funding to support uh, a board president's uh, program. So. OK, there we go. That's yeah. that's the kind of stuff we need that. We need those. Yeah. Kind of, we've got to we've got to focus more on the governance piece. And we haven't. It's just all been the aspirant piece. And we still need to focus on that. But we've got to do much more with the because as you as a, the examples I just showed you earlier, those are not necessarily new present issues. Those are board issues. Or like I said, in Tennessee, when you got just the governor just shaking the whole thing up, that's that's out of everybody's hands now. So it's you know, what do you do with that? I mean, that's those are the kinds of things. So good question. But yeah, we got to lean more on how do we strengthen the boards? Because if you get and as Janetta Cole said in her situation, she had really good boards. In my situation, I had really I I cannot complain. Like I said, I, I can't complain about the board. The board, we didn't always agree, but they were really thoughtful. We had good conversations. We worked together. I can't ask for more than that. That's great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I want to say thank you to you, Walter, just for giving uh, so much knowledge, your uh, perspective on things. Really, really appreciate that. Also want to say thank you to all of the people who put questions in the chat. I try to get to as many as possible, um, and but we know that there are more. And I think you said it was fine if we wanted to give your email. In Absolutely. The yeah. We'll put your email in the chat. And um, just so that folks know, we will be having next uh, fall and spring, we'll be doing special series related to presidents and uh, boards. And those will be open 
to the public. And um, if you signed up for this, you will definitely get an invite. This event is recorded, so we will send you a recording of this event. Uh, and hopefully you can, uh, if you're teaching or if you uh, want to do some professional development, you can use it. Um, we are really grateful to our staff at the Proctor Institute and the Center for MSIs for always doing such a great job putting things together. And again, just want to say um, thank you, uh, Walter. We, um, we really, really appreciate all of your um, thoughts and perspectives. So thank Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks, everybody. Take good care. Bye.